I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, home to the one and only Story Cycle system. Do you want people to actually give a crap about you and your purpose-driven company? Then our proven system will help you tell them a better friggin' story. And that's the secret sauce, folks. You gotta have a better, clear story. You can get started right now by downloading your 64-page DIY brand story strategy workbook at businessofstory.com. It's filled with examples, links to tutorial videos, and will help you clarify your story to grow your revenue and amplify your impact. And if you're really proud of how your brand story comes together, let me know. We might put you on our show to share your new narrative with the world. So download your Story Cycle Guide right now as you listen to today's show. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. When I was a kid growing up in Woodenville, Washington, north of Seattle, my dad would take us downtown to Recreational Equipment Co-op. That's what they used to call REI back in the day. This was in the 1970s, and REI was nothing more than a store in a dank basement with outdoor wear piled high on folding tables. I remember an overhead water pipe leaking on a down jacket in the middle of the table, and nobody much seemed to care. Hell, they figured that that's what the damn thing was built to do, so let it drip. That was the character of the place, which was simply a reflection of the rugged Pacific Northwest. At least that's what this young boy took in. Then my dad crouched down and pointed to a fella over in the corner. You know who that is, he asked. No, why should I? I'm like seven years old, I thought. That's Lou Whitaker. He sort of whispered, so as not to look like a groupie, I suppose. Well, Whitaker is a legendary mountain climber from Seattle and founder of Rainier Mountaineering. He led the first American ascent on the North Pole of Mount Everest in 1984, just to give you an idea about this guy's mountaineering skills. Well, he was just hanging out with his REI pals in this dark and musty store, talking about their next exploits, I assume. It was pretty impressive, and I absolutely loved the place. Now, it's been over 40 years, and REI has grown to become the mega outdoor retailer you know today. So I was impressed the moment I saw REI's new Opt Outside campaign two years ago. It felt as authentic to me when they launched it as that first store did back in the day. REI's Opt Outside campaign encourages consumers to opt out of the madness of Black Friday shopping the day after Thanksgiving and do something anything in the great outdoors. The campaign spoke to me as a brand truly living its story and encouraging others to join the journey. A year ago, I reached out to Paul Venables, founder of Venables Bell & Partners, the San Francisco agency at the heart of the creation of the Opt Outside movement. I invited him on the show to talk about it, but he didn't want to take credit for it. Instead, he pointed me to his associate partner and creative director, Lee Einhorn the gentleman who is really at the heart of this program. So now, as we head into Thanksgiving week in the third year of REI's Black Friday movement, I'm honored to have Lee on our show to take us through the development of the campaign. This episode is especially meaningful for me because as you listen to this show, I am with my parents in Seattle getting ready for another wonderful holiday. And I can guarantee you that even though they're 91 and 92 years old, they'll both be opting outside this Friday, like millions of other Americans. So how did REI do it? Well, here's Lee to show us how. Hey, Lee, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for having me. Appreciate it. Well, you know, here we are 
the beginning of Thanksgiving week leading in to Black Friday in perhaps one of my favorite campaigns of all time, and that's the Opt Outside campaign for REI. And you're one of the guys right at the middle of this. So I'm so excited to have you on here and talk about this program. Well, I love talking about it. So thanks. Let's go back a little bit. You have also worked in some pretty other amazing campaigns, Truth in particular, on um, helping to curb teenage smoking and whatnot. Can you give us a bit of a backstory about how did you get into advertising in the first place, and do these kinds of campaigns just naturally involve you? Well, going all the way back to when I was a teen, I would actually have my mom give me clients to then go into my room and this was before computers, and I would physically draw out print ads for different clients. So I knew I wanted to work in advertising from a, from a pretty early age. I, I studied art history. I went to art school after that. My first job was actually as a, as a media planner in advertising, which was definitely yeah. the wrong department for me. But I <laughs> um, quickly sort of righted that, went back, studied graphic design a bit more, and then as soon as I came out, was ready to go find a creative job. And one of the first jobs I had is actually the, the second agency I worked for was to work on the Truth Campaign um, at Arnold uh, Arnold in Boston. And um, it was it was pretty much a dream first job in advertising. I mean, it was it was getting to jump in right away on a big you know big national budget is always awesome. But to be able to do something that actually had some meaning and was actually out there not to not to sell sell to people, but to go and you know actually try to help a certain group of people, it was really pretty special. I had to change behavior and kind of rail against the duplicity of the big tobacco. I loved yeah. uh, some of the approach in this where you, I think you guys went out and you spoke to a lot of teenagers, did research, and they love smoking mm -hmm. because it's rebellious. But then you just had to reframe that story about rebellion and, and say, do you realize that the old folks that are running big tobacco are just totally using you? You essentially are tools to them. So why don't you rebel against them exactly. and turn away from tobacco? Exactly. It was, um, you know, it was it was finding finding the other thing to rebel against, which was big tobacco. Really identifying that enemy. And you know, one of the big things was we never said don't smoke to kids because typically, from the research we did, you tell a teenager not to do something, and then they're gonna go do that right away, right? So instead, you know, we we created this brand and found this enemy in the tobacco companies, and it just became, you know, it so quickly became this amazing movement. That you know, eventually, I think saw you know teen smoking uh, rates dropped by about twenty nine percent at the height of it uh, when we were working on it, and it was it was also just really fun, amazing work to do. It was very non traditional in every way. You know, we had the budgets to go make big Super Bowl -y sized television commercials, but our you know our approach was was very different there was a lot of activism kind of involved in it a lot of filmed activism a lot of you know stunts in some ways where we would really take it out to the streets to where people were hanging out where the you know where these kids were that we wanted to talk to and at times even right to big tobacco i mean one of the first famous things we worked on was you know put placing body bags outside of philip morris in new york city and that was sort of the the campaign that that kicked it all off and from there it just sort of took off that we knew we you know we we seldom did a commercial that that wasn't involved you know there wasn't some kind of spy camera involved or you know sort of some sort of shooting that people didn't necessarily know about yeah and the body bag stunt man i remember that like it was yesterday and when i was reading up on that i didn't realize it was way back in like 2000 so that's almost 17 yep. years ago i can't believe it. I know. But that oh, campaign God, that's how long i've been doing this yeah. <laughs> oh believe me i've got you beat by a long shot um but it's yeah. just indelibly stamped in my mind of how visual that was and what it was about 1,200 body bags you rolled out there and, and hollering you. Yep, 1,200. You're killing 1,200 people a day with tobacco, so. Yeah, well, I mean, every one of the stunts, you know, that we did would, would be based on a fact. So the 1,200, you know, was that number that you just mentioned. Had that, you know, that's so many people die a day, you know, from, from smoking or secondhand smoking. So, you know, the facts were what, you know, and it was hard. I mean, I, it, it, for my first job in advertising as a creative, I, I spoke to more lawyers as a young creative just because we had to substantiate all these things, you know, all these different facts that we wanted to go out and sort of make into this, um, make into the truth campaign. And just to answer your, you know, wh where we started before this question, I think being able to work on that from the beginning has definite, it definitely 
for me, I've been, I've always been searching for that sort of like finding meaning in the, in the different campaigns that I'm working on. And, you know, very often I'm just advertising the latest car, you know, from Audi or this beer or, you know, uh, whatever consumer packaged goods product it might be. But, you know, I've always tried to bring something in, whether it's a side campaign that does something for good. So, when something like REI, you know, came up and at the at the heart of what that company wanted to do was to was to make a statement and do something different. You know, I think beyond besides the truth campaign for me, that was definitely that's the one other, you know, thing that I've gotten to be at the center of and be part of that was that was just special because it just it went beyond advertising. And what did you feel um, since you were so new, young into the industry of the truth campaign? What did you learn in that campaign that you were able to uh, leverage when you started you know, creative directing and planning the opt outside campaign? I think using our power for good was kind of, you know, how we thought about it. Um, when we did the truth campaign and, I, you know, I think, and, and also like getting that movement going, I think the movement thing is probably the best correlation between the two. You know, we, with, with the truth campaign, it was about getting, you know, speaking to teens in a, in a, in a language that, you know, we should be speaking to them in, not as authoritative parents telling them what to do or not to do, but kind of becoming one of them and getting this movement started and supplying the movement with all the tools they would need, you know, really giving it back to them. I think both REI and Truth, it was like our job was to sort of strike the match and get things, you know, get, you know, fan the fires as they got started. But then people just took it on themselves and they, and they, you know, the, it was the people that made the campaigns, both campaigns, as big as they were. Yeah, so you think about it, maybe not so much from a traditional advertising marketing campaign approach, but really more about creating a movement that stirs Definitely. people into action and gets them thinking about it. So you're not telling them or declaring for them what they need to do, but help them arrive at what that is, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, and I mean, like you said, 17 years ago versus today, the tools that we have today to do that with social media, right? Yeah. You know, all the different social platforms, digital in general, you know, just, you know, thinking that way, like, I, you know, I mean, the truth campaign still exists, there's less money, it's not as out there as it's been. But when it came to REI, like, that fire we had to light was was much more flammable, I guess, or, or whatever <laughs> we were lighting the campaign because of social and because we could instantly put it in the hands of the people to make the movement their own. Yeah. And that's what was so exciting about that, man. It was just like, you know, obviously nervousness as we you know crafted the story and what the story was going to be but like once we started to let it out of the bag and we you know we first told the employees of REI that was the first group that that you know that heard about it because so much of what we were doing was for those employees you know that these these are people i forget the exact number of employees at REI right now but you know these are people that never had a Black Friday off. You know, they worked in retail. They never had that relaxing Thanksgiving with family where they could do whatever they wanted. You know, I wanted to do. So we started with that group, and and we saw how instantly it took off amongst that group. Then from there, we moved on to the REI Co-op. You know, the five million Co-op members. Um, I have to check my number on that too, but it's something like that. But it's a ton. Uh, the. Yep. The REI co-op was the next group who was like, yes, you know, like, this is amazing. This is how I want to spend my, you know, my Thanksgiving weekend. I don't want to be, you know, fighting the crowds and stores with, you know, all the chaos that is Black Friday. So I think they instantly appreciated it. And now we had that number of people as like the next level of our of our movement that was going to take it out there. And then that's when the social came in and people engaged and, you know, the opt outside hashtag, you know, which – was at the key of all this and and still is a super important hashtag not even just for REI but you know it's been sort of adopted by people in general which is as sort of a mantra for getting out there and um you know just to see the movement take off was was really special you know we told the story and then people made it their own that was really incredible and uh, reading back on it it sounded like REI had this idea of closing down on Black Friday they weren't really sure what to do with it so they went out and did an agency review that's right and threw it out to a number of agencies so you guys were competing to try to mm -hmm. get this business and I imagine like it you know happens with all of us as we're putting these these campaigns together you had probably a ton of ideas more ideas than you could really get your arms around yeah when was it that that opt outside aha moment hit and can you take us to when you you're like boom that's it yeah so it you know there was i can't remember the exact number maybe four or five agencies that were pitching for it was for a holiday project they wanted to do something disruptive something different at the holidays something that felt like it came 
you know, f- from from the philosophy of of that brand, you know, and you know, like they wanted to do something that would tell really tell the story of why they exist. You know, that like you said, they had, you know, one sort of it wasn't like the lead thought in any way. It was like, you know, we'd even be willing to close our stores. <laughs> you know, which we and I'll I'll be honest, we we heard that in the initial pitch or the initial, you know, you do a chemistry check where you go up and make sure everybody likes each other and there isn't any mm-hmm. old girlfriends or boyfriends that might cause a problem that you didn't know worked that you know worked at the agency or at REI. <laughs> and, and um we heard that and I remember we were driving back to the airport, I think, you know, in Seattle and, you know, we were gonna go back and we were gonna bring them back other ideas and we did bring them back other sort of disruptive holiday. How would, you know, how do we sh- how do how, how would REI, which believes, you know, a life outdoors is a life well lived, how would they celebrate you know, the holiday season, but like we could not get that idea out of our head, you know? And, and, and again, it was kind of thrown out like, yeah, hey, yeah, we might be willing to do this, but we don't know. We got to check with Jerry, you know, who's the, the CEO. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we, we came back with a, with a number of a different ideas. I think the next session that we did with them was a, um, I think they cut it down to maybe just us or maybe one other, a couple other places after that. But we did this kind of cool meeting thing that we that we do sometimes, where we we bring an artist in, like a cartoonist, and you know he's he's got some, you know he's he's met with us once, but we sit there and we have this collaborative meeting where he sort of draws the meeting out as we go, you know, mm-hmm. and you know, and it's cool because like stories start to develop, you know, even in the room as you're there, and that just that just sort of took over the room, you know? I mean, I remember when we first said, like, we were really, pre- you know, we presented, we can put Santa Claus up on a mountain and people have to go up there to see Santa Claus, you know, to hike up or we, you know, and there's, you know, I mean, lots of different ideas. All of them felt, they felt stunty and they just didn't, they didn't have the depth of where we had taken, you know, what to do uh, for the opt-out side idea. So, I mean, back to your question, I, I think, you know, it, it could have been in, driving was there ubers back then probably an uber <laughs> or a cab back to the sea airport you know i think we were like wow wait if they're willing to do that and i think we got back we worked on it great couple different great teams on it and i think i think it was i think it was gavin who's our communications uh strategy guy who somehow said like people people are going to want to opt outside and and i think when we heard even that and we you know the writer might have thrown a <laughs> thrown a hashtag symbol in front of it once that opt outside handle was part of this i don't we didn't really want to talk to them about anything else it was just like that's what we need to do we need to get to jerry we need to you know we need to blow this out and and, and make this how venables would you know would would tell this story um, and, you know, and we did, and we, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, Jerry's reaction at first was just like, you know, looking at us, looking at Ben Steele, our amazing client there, so brave and, you know, just forever friendship with him. Um, and, uh, you know, he kind of looked at us like, you guys are crazy, but let's hear more about it. And we sort of laid out the plan of how we saw this story manifesting and, you know, how, how, again, it was going to get to that important, you know, sort of. Jerry's mantra of a life outdoors is a life well lived. He, you know, as soon, you know, as soon as we got through that meeting, he was in, he was on. And then it was just like, how do we make this the greatest thing we've ever done? And you guys launched it Black Friday of 2015. How long did you have from the time you had that very uh, initial meeting with REI to come up with a campaign and then to produce it? Are you talking a year here or less? No, much less. I think it was... The initial meetings, if I'm remembering correctly, feel like they were like February-ish. And then by the time we were like, okay, all systems go, might have been like April. Mm -hmm. And then we had – it was the summer where we were up on the mountain with Jerry shooting him and the desk that we brought up to this. We were almost north of Seattle. I was wondering like the Piljuk mountain area or mount baker area up in there mount baker mount Mount baker Baker, exactly yeah and we stayed up in these cabins which was amazing (laughs) um one of our account person went into her cabin and there was already someone staying in her cabin and it it was very shining ish up there too so (laughs) you know the shining so it it was a little creepy she ended up coming back and sleeping on the couch you know at, at the place i shared with a few other guys but but i mean we were out there and you know i think that that was a sp out there in the middle of nowhere creating this thing about getting out there and you know and, and it was it was all pretty perfect i mean n- nice story from that shoot too jerry you know the ceo he we were filming with him you know we had you know full camera crew you know full production crew up on this mountain great vantage point 
you know, it was winter, but there was snowy things. Or it was not winter; it was like summer, but but you know, already snow up on peaks and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And he, you know, he said, you know, we got there, and he said, "How long is this going to take?" You know, because I'd love to go climb that, uh, you know, <laughs> climb that other peak over there if we have time. And we were like, "Jerry, you're not. You have to do this today." Sorry. He's like, "Well, maybe if I get a couple minutes, I could just." You were like, "No," you know. And he didn't. He didn't want to sit still for a minute. And I think, I think he got his game face on, and he got it done just so he could could go take a little walk even while we were filming yeah (laughs) it's great so then it was by september i think we were kind of locked in by october mid-october is when we maybe like sometime in october is when we let the employees know so you know we had maybe three or four months you know and, and we actually built we we were up in seattle a lot we had a war room up there that included us and the media company the pr company employees from there you know this yeah horrible windowless room to be honest for the opposite of what it means to get outside <laughs> but uh but that's you know that was uh it, it was locked down and it was it was it was exciting and fun and just you know it made the fact that, you know it, it wasn't easy and the fact that it took off the way it did just made it that much more special well in rei's brand purpose i i think i read somewhere and maybe i connected the dots that it's its brand purpose but it says rei exists to get people outdoors that, that's its, yep. it, its whole shtick. So when you land yep. on something like opt outside, which is much more than just a, a hashtag, it's a call to action. But it's a call to action yep. coming from the very soul of the brand. And it just must have been a wonderful moment when you hit on it. And it's like, there it is. We got it. And yep. then you just start growing from it from there. Yep. Another part of the campaign that I found interesting that it sounded like you guys kind of happened upon and then it took off was your meme generator. You like the meme generator idea? It was really easy for people to take po- pictures of themselves opting outside and sharing that. Oh, yeah. But it, it became the mechanism that really added to the virality of the campaign. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And that wasn't just – I mean, that was a very thought-out thing, actually. We didn't just happen to – I mean, that was – the idea behind that was that was going to be our tool. That 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 was going to be our thing that, that helped this movement start. You know, we wanted to put something in the hands of the people so they could raise their hand. They could say, yes, I agree. You know, I'm going to opt outside too. But, I mean, that was the thing that, you know, for me, and this is, you know, going back to my mom and, and my early advertising uh, career when I was 14, you know, like when I started seeing on Facebook her friends doing this, having no idea that, you know, it was from the, the, this world that I was in, like that's when I knew. Like when you when you create something that goes beyond sort of your little advertising bubble of people on your social media platforms, you know, like, and, you know, and it's not just the people you follow, you know, in a business sense, like that's when the spread happened and it was that tool – that 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 let people do that. It was that tool that that allowed people to make it personal. That let people make it their own. I mean, we we gave people pictures they could choose from, things that they could write down to say what they were going to do when they go outside. But you know, the whole idea was that you know we wanted people to make it theirs and engage. You know, and then if they wanted to just say, "I'll be biking and use one of the things that we supplied them," that's great too. But it was so great to see how people again help helped help the movement happen by making it their own well and you made it really really easy and you placed them yeah. at the center of the story so the story is not about rei really it's yep. about rei making something happen that then can bring in you know the collective the, the community around it and you don't even have exactly. to be an rei shopper to appreciate it no no but what a way to be introduced to the brand i'd say oh yeah and and you know they got a lot of new new co-op members from it, you know, I mean, those numbers were up. I mean, not that, again, it wasn't about this, but, you right. know, they were willing to give up the money they'd make on that day just for that goodwill and just to spread that philosophy. Um, that was, like you said, at the heart of the company. And, you know, it's it's always a bonus when, you know, people decided to come in droves over the next couple of weeks to REI and do their holiday shopping there. Yeah. So. I was presenting, uh, doing a workshop here in Phoenix a couple of weeks ago for the International Association of Business Communicators, and it was all about CSR brand storytelling, corporate social yeah. responsibility. Sure. And I went through mm-hmm. a couple different campaigns, and the very last one was I, I landed on Opt Outside, and the entire mm-hmm. room lit up. And these are CSR yeah. and PR directors. And then I got right. to thinking, did you guys ever think of this as a CSR campaign, or did it just naturally evolve to be that? just naturally and that's what was so cool and that's what took me back to truth which was just that's what that was too you know and it's amazing because so many brands since then 
So to answer your question, no, 100% this was not set out to be that. I don't think, C- I mean, CSR since then comes up with everyone, mm-hmm. you know, that comes to us and says, oh, that REI campaign, what's our, <laughs> you know, what's our CSR campaign going to be? And I, you know, I'd like to go back and say, like, you know what, that was a campaign from that brand that was, you know, truly who they are. And it, it, the goal was not to go do, you know, I'm sure you've seen on Saturday Night Live, maybe you haven't that hard cut Cheetos skit that, <laughs> yeah. that Alec Baldwin did, you know, and it's the truth is it comes up a lot. And after REI, you know, we got a lot of calls for that kind of stuff. And, you know, some we've taken, some we haven't, but we always did remind people that that's not where it started from. And, um, you know, any storytelling, like, like I, I also um, lead the, the branded entertainment group here at Venables as well as one of my associate partner duties. And, um, you know, that's another one where, like, it's really easy to go to the CSR for that kind of stuff as well, you know, find the document, you know, the documentary about, I can't think of an example right mm-hmm. now, but, you know, that it's an easy branded entertainment sort of docu thing to check off. But, you know, all of all of that work, you know, those stories that we want to tell, I mean, they they all they all need to have that sort of amazing something at the center of it, you know, that amazing heart that's there. And then you can go tell any kind of story, you know, and it might be a CSR type thing, but it might just be something, you know, a really great scripted comedy, something that makes sense because you still see the heart of the brand in it. So I, my hope is that, you know, uh, m- more and more we're going to be, you know, like we like doing the, those corporate social responsibility things when they make sense. But I think it, it's tough when you can put, get put into the trap of just doing it just to, you know, just to do it if there really isn't something there at the yeah. heart of it. I mean, so so many CSR programs just seem to be bolt-ons that they're just, yeah, like they you are. say, check something off. And so they, yeah, they like, don't ring true. You know, Patagonia has mm-hmm. always been really good in this area, and they came in last year on Black Friday and did their 100% for the planet. Um, yep. They gave away 100, apparently 100%, what, $10 million in revenue or something like that to uh, various causes. Yep. Was that a reaction to what REI was doing, or were they just kind of also jumping on board saying, REI's got something here, and we're going to do our part in our own way? Yeah. I mean, you know, they're they're definitely frenemies to REI, right? I mean, you know, they sell a lot of, you know, REI sells a lot of Patagonia stuff. We 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 actually talked a lot about that. My guess is that, you know, I think they probably saw that REI got some good juice off doing that the year before, but I also think they have a history as well, Patagonia. You know, I think that there was another ad they did years ago that was about like don't buy this sweater or yeah, something yeah, like that. Don't Again, buy it was this just jacket, an ad. way back. A jacket, yep. yeah, right. You know, and I, you know, so I think they're they're definitely another brand that has, you know, has something there at the heart of who they are that that cares about that. But, and I wanted to talk about this too. I mean, what was so exciting was how many other companies, you know, once we got it out there, you know, especially you know, in year one it was super cool. I mean, it's now continued, but all of a sudden, you know, we have this big movement of people who have made this campaign their own. And then the company started coming, right? So and so is also going to close. This one's going to close down. And it it was, you know, it was, it was companies, you know, big and small. I mean, even like you, you even saw tweets that were out there because obviously we did a lot of social listening as you know as part of this. You know, this pub is going to close on Black Friday yeah. and not be open. You know, and it was just it was really that that's when it really feels like like it went from like wow this is taking off to like you know off the charts when other businesses decided to follow suit, yeah. you know, that, that was that, that was that, you know, sound bite that I think we were looking for. Cause it was like, wow, you know, this is, this is really exploding. Well, one of the fun things you all did that I just got a kick out of is the freeze dried Thanksgiving leftovers that you sent out yeah. to influencers Love just that. to get their attention. That That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think that was, you know, we did that. I can't remember exactly when that. I think once we announced we did that, or maybe a few days before. But that, um, and I remember, you know, just brainstorming that idea with with uh, Adam and Avery, who were the 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 main team that I had working on that. And you know, we um, we just you know like to get things out to influencers, to get their social response, you know, and thank you know thanking the brand for it, you know, because like you know. It, it it just made things that much more more legit when you have that that hiker biker kayaker you know I can't remember all the different people that we went out to when you have that person that that you admire that's like you know showing this goodwill from the brand I mean we got people asking you know where else, you know where how can they get this are there more somewhere <laughs> we'll pay we'll do this for it so it was uh 
it was just another, you know, it was, like I said, we were super meticulous on how we got this message out there and, you know, very planned that on this date, this would drop and this date, this would drop. And then we'd come out with the patch that we'd sell in the store and then we'd drop Jerry's video and so much planning went into it. It was, it, it was, you know, what seemed maybe simple from the outside yeah. world. It was, you know, there, there was a lot to this story and, you know, we wanted, you know, one we wanted to be smart as well and as as far as when this story broke because we wanted to become like one key earned media thing was that we whenever you know there was a story about Sears is going to be open on Thanksgiving morning this year you know like any of those stories that happened we wanted to be part you know this is part of our pre PR strategy we wanted to become part of those stories so whenever they talked about the negative of Black Friday we always got to mention at the beginning or end of that, you know, mm-hmm. unlike REI, who's not opening this year, you know, and, and that actually went into last year too. And I'm, you know, anticipating more this year, even still where, you know, we, we were still part of the story and we, so we really maintain this like pretty high level of chatter um, about the campaign from the minute we dropped it, you know, until probably Christmas. So. Well, and you mentioned earlier back when you were talking about the truth campaign of having to have a villain, and have a you know a better story to that anti story. So in this case, I would imagine the villain was this the blatant consumerism of yes. Black Friday over a family holiday. That is your villain, and REI is here to show you a different way. Exactly. It was a pretty. It was pretty. It was pretty simple. You know, we had to. You know, we we went through more Black Friday footage that actually didn't end up. You know, the smashing of the front of the Target stores and all that. That that awfulness that does happen, and you know, yes, that was our villain. But in the end, we wanted to keep the story as positive as possible, and really make it seem, you know, like we we needed that to push off for sure. But but working with REI, the more that we could just keep it about the positivity of what it means, you know, to to go outside, spend time with family, you know, we we tried to weigh it more there than you know it all being about the anti, anti, anti the whole yeah. time. Yeah, and I saw some reports, too, that when you have such a great story like this, a great campaign, you're going to get the trolls that show up and say, oh, REI is just greenwashing. Oh, yeah. They're not, they don't really care about this. It's just a yep. stunt to sell you more, more stuff on Saturday. How did, how, right. What did you guys think about that, and how, did, how were you prepared to push off of that when it was bound yeah. to grow, you know, show up? Sure. I mean, you know, I think – you always anticipate something like that's going to happen. You know, it, there's just always going to be that other side. I mean, I'll be honest. I think we looked past a lot of it. You know, we definitely didn't respond to it. I feel like the more you dig in, you know, th- you know, to things like that, you know, uh, with uh, with people pushing off, the more you know that they just kind of fire back, and it just sort of gains power. Um, I think REI was very clear in their bravery that they didn't care what other people said. You know, this is what they were going to do. People could think what they want to think. But we were, we did try to be very clear from the beginning that this was not a stunt. This wasn't a stunt to just, you know, like you said, get people there shopping on Saturday. And because it came again, I I know I keep saying this, but from the heart of what they Mm -hmm. believe in. You know, it, it was hard for people to punch holes in it because, you know, you go to the store, you talk to these employees who have worked there for a long time. Like the average, you know, these are these are like dedicated long term retail people. And they're there because they not only love what they sell, but they love participating in the activities, you know, that that what they sell pushes them towards. And I think, you know, I mean, no campaign is ever, you know you know, foolproof in any way, but like it was, it was hard for people to really punch holes in it if they looked deep into who, who they were as a company and what we were trying to say. And again, we gave a lot of this out to the people, as you said, they were the movement, you know, we lit the fire, you know, we made our statement and then it was, you know, it was our little meme thing that went out there and all the other stuff that, you know, that all the different tools that we built, you mm-hmm. know, that, um, that spoke for themselves. So yeah, you allowed them again to be the center of the story and they owned it. It, it, it was so well done. Uh, from my perspective, I asked myself after the first one, I thought, okay, how much planning went into year two, year three, and beyond? You know, so it didn't look like a stunt because I assumed if you'd only done it the one year in 2015, the trolls would come back and say, yeah, you know, that was a nice shtick they did. Right. But you guys yeah. had to have been looking long term with this uh, program. Yeah. So we worked on the first year. 
the second year they were you know but we kind of made a deal like you know they were going to continue to close i mean i don't know if you remember seeing what they put out last year it was you know not not they closed the stores they stayed true to that there was some messaging around it and like i said it it went beyond this campaign for the holidays and became just sort of you know pretty much the tagline of REI. So mm-hmm. we we did not work on it the last couple of years. Um, we're hoping to get back on them with a different kind of project soon. You know, the last two years and forever, they have pledged to, that they will not be open on that day. That is what they are doing from here on out. But as far as messaging goes, you know, that's not something we haven't worked on that with you. them. And, it, and it's it's been a much smaller, you know, thing now that they've established that's what they do. So you just totally blew my le- next line of questioning, and oh, that no. is, how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep <laughs> it moving? Because I see that I'm already getting emails uh, within the last two days of yeah. their op- opt-outside campaign. And I, I mean, see I they- can answer that mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, you know, how, I, I mean, again, we are we are not uh, doing that. But to me, you know, maybe just to shift your question, it would be, how does a brand like REI keep this kind of whether it's on black friday or somewhere else messaging fresh you know i think they're going to continue to make statements they're going to continue to be a brand of meaning you know that you know again goes back to this this belief in going outside but i think they sort of established themselves as someone who's not afraid to, to 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 take a step and make a movement and i think from talking to them over the last year now and then you know there's some things coming up that i think they'll continue to you know, throw down and light a fire. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, I'm hopeful that we work on it. I'm hopeful that you'll see things just because I love the brand and I love the people associated that'll continue to start conversations in this area or other areas as well. Well, I loved what you've done with it too, of course. And when I look at what they sent me, how do you want to hashtag opt outside? They're also opening up for a lot of other hashtags. So I guess even though it might be adding to the confusion of which hashtag do you want me to use on this, I guess the idea is to start playing into other people's stories and the hashtags that they're already using and combine the two to help grow the campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and like you said, it all starts from the heart. You've got to be authentic. You've got to have the right story moving forward. And once you've got that, you don't even have to defend it. You can say, this is just who we are, and this is what we do, and this is why we are taking a stance in this. And like you said, the bravery of it all. And I, 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 I know that's a big part of it. It really is. And, you know, I think the, just what, you know, the, we, we we tell a lot of film stories, right? I mean, we're you know this agency has done a lot of you know very well known television commercials, longer kind of films. What I love so much, just you know, getting back to you know just just talking about story for one more second, was how we told this story was in a, such a non traditional way, and you know I think it just shows that like all the tools that we have available to us today. You know, the different social media platforms, different digital tools, you know, mobile first things, et cetera. You know, there's so many amazing ways to tell stories these days that I think, you know, for me as as a, you know, as a storyteller for life here now, because I don't think I don't think there's time. You know, or energy to do to try to do something else. Um, you know, I'm just I get excited that like you know like I'm always wanting to use whatever the latest thing is to get the to you know to tell a story. And at the heart of all these things, whatever whatever technology is, is still the basic tenets of a story. You know, you need some tension. You need to find an enemy. You know, you need to suck people in and speak to people. You know, in a voice that the, uh, that they'll understand and they'll believe. And I think it you know. Every day gets more exciting um, as we tell stories in these new and different ways. Well, and to be able to react to what's happening on around you, I, w- I told Paul, I shot him a note, Paul Venables, about yes. one of my favorite spots, and maybe you had a hand in this for Audi, the prom spot that I think ran in the, what, 2013 Super Bowl potential? I think so. Yep, right around there. Yeah. Loved it. I mean, I just, out of all the spots, that was the one that rocked me. And so I put Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey to it. I boiled it down to my 10-step story cycle. And I said, look at this. This spot yeah. follows the cycle exactly. In fact, I wrote a blog post about it. I'll put it in the, the show notes here. I sent yeah. it to Paul, and I said, when you guys went after this, did you in, were you intentional about this story structure? And he said something I loved. He goes, no, actually not. And I said, how do you think you arrived? at this he said well because we are natural trained 
And intentional storytellers, we don't necessarily need the framework. We just know how to tell stories. Yeah. But for all of those that don't work for your great firm or don't feel like they are great storytellers, you can follow an intentional framework, not a formula, but a framework sure. to help you get to those points. Definitely. Yeah, that's not, that sounds like a Paul Venables answer for sure. And I, I didn't have, um, you know, I didn't, I did not work directly on that. But uh, it is it is one of my favorites as well. And I think, you know, I think whether or not the team, you know, on it was following an exact thing or not, I think they know they know those elements that need to go in yeah. to tell a good story. Yeah, that's what I think, too. And I got to tell you, I can't show it anymore at workshops because here's what happened starting oh, yeah. this time last year. I used to use it as an example, uh -huh. um, take them through the process. I'd show the spot and say, now let's just dissect the spot. And you'll see that these storytellers hit on all these points. And, it, you know, they just are innately good and they're trained at what they do. But when the young man steals the kiss from the prom uh, queen, so I can't good. show that anymore because of what Trump did. Oh, um, God. And people <laughs> rail against me. I mean, I, I get... Yeah. I get shit about that. So I had to literally take it out of my presentations because it was touching such a nerve. Oh, man. All right. Well, yeah. I'll, Just, I'll, send, I'll send you a new spot soon with a great story. <laughs> that you can... I would love to replace <laughs> it. But what that also tells me is it is a story that connects. And that's what you're doing. And you know, yeah. with all the political correctness aside, the way you guys shot it, I felt like it was the innocence of youth. Yeah. And, you know, you're just capturing something that we've all been through one way, shape or form. That's not creepy. It was done in a yeah. fun way. Right. But, you know, it's funny. It's like Lee. I think it was Lee Cloud that I think it was his quote or maybe Jay Shide or something. But, you know, people when people can see themselves in a piece of film, in a story, you know, or see their mom or their that uncle they have or whatever, that's what helps them to connect, you know. And I think that was one from like the bratty little sister to, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the sort of, you know, kid at the prom who doesn't want to really be there and whatever. You know, I think like – Every great story has that connection, and um, that's what we strive for all the time. I love it, too. And you even put the moral of the story at the end of it, you know, bravery. It's what defines us. So exactly. it defines us as a brand, and yep. it's the value you can connect with your audiences. And right I guess you really more important than anything, not only in just ad campaigns, but in movements as you've created them throughout your career, mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it's connecting those beliefs and values. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, Lee, thank you so much. Any parting words for our listeners out there that are trying to tell better stories? Gosh, I feel like we've we've covered <laughs> we've it all. Covered it. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know. I want to have something super witty to say, but I think I'm uh, <laughs> I think I'm storied out at the <laughs> moment. Out. But you know, I uh, I just thank you so much for having me. It was super fun, and you know, I'll be happy to come back anytime once I go create the next movement. Well, Lee, I, I appreciate that. And as your mom had a tremendous impact on you, and as I told my listeners at the beginning of the show, my dad introduced me to REI when I was just a little kid. Mm -hmm. Back then, they called it Re Re Recreational Equipment Co-op, and it That's literally right. was in a musty basement downtown mm -hmm. Seattle, and we were down there, and I was blown away. They just had all the stuff out on the folding tables, and there was even a leaking pipe that was leaking wow. right down on some down clothing, and I just thought this is so cool they love their yeah. stuff so much they just let the water leak on it and my dad points out over across the way and he says you see who that is there and i go no dad who is it it's lou whitaker one of the famous mountaineers of the yep. Pacific northwest and yeah. he was just hanging out with his buddies drinking coffee chatting yeah. rei so when i saw your campaign come out a couple years ago it literally hit home i saw myself in your campaign and for that i thank you and thank you for being here on business's story oh thank you so much all right. I'd like to thank you all for listening to this edition. If you liked what you hear, do your friend a favor and share it with them, especially if they are in the world of sustainability or CSR or just trying to tell better stories to connect with people and move them to action. And certainly if I can help you do that, visit me over at businessofstory.com. And until next week, I want you to remember the most potent story you're ever going to tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Take care.